Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the, I think, 21st uh, JCT Pov Povey Annual Lecture. It's an event at which uh, an eminent person in the construction industry is invited to speak on an important matter that's relevant to our industry. And the purpose of the lecture is to en encourage ways of continuing to improve the quality and value of construction, but I think it's actually also so that we all have a, a dialogue about things that are important to us. Um, just to remind you, those that, you, that, that need reminding or don't know, this lecture was instituted in honour of Philip John Povey, who was, I think it's fair to say, one of the founding draftsmen of the JCT. And he worked with the JCT as a draftsman and um, secretary with the REBA member for more than 50 years. Um, a barrister by profession, um, Unfortunately, um, he left us in 2001 and this lecture commemorates him. So this afternoon we have the pleasure of hearing from Simon Tolson, who's an extremely eminent construction litigator. Um, perhaps to say he's a litigator does Simon a disservice because he's so much more. He's also an arbitrator, an adjudicator and a, a CEDAR CEDA qualified mediator. Um, and the past chairman of the Technology and Construction Solicitors Association. And Simon's going to talk to us um, this afternoon about, um, well, he's calling it the Terminator, which sounds quite apocalyptic, but it's about the very important issue of when, if ever, it's a good idea to terminate a construction contract. And Simon's going to explore a number of areas, and even, I believe, um, read us some original poetry that he composed with a bit of help from other sources on the topic. Simon. Thank you very much indeed. Start. Well, First of all, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or good, good evening for anyone that is watching this at another date, or uh, good morning as well. Um, my lecture today, as uh, Cam was just saying, is called The Terminator, and that's because uh, it's a very dear subject to a lot of construction lawyers. It's a very uh, busy area, often, sadly, because it is the subject of many dispute areas uh, in the law, and people get it uh, wrong more often than they get it right. So that's really the kind of genesis to it. Um, in terms of my own background, perhaps just I, I thought I'd spend just a second just saying, uh, I've been, besides being a construction lawyer for 37 years, I did actually work in the construction industry briefly, which is why I've got a little bit of a passion for it. Worked for various contractors in the early 80s and uh, was dragged around building sites as a child uh, for the reason of my father being an architect. So disputes and termination are, as I say, quite, quite a, a hot subject for me. Um, now, the reason why uh, I picked the Terminator was because of the, 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 the significance of the Termination Act, which is a bit like a firearm and exercising it or discharging it. And it's a dangerous thing if, if that obviously gets misfired. So that's the passing kind of connection to, uh, to that process. And when one thinks about it, um, termination is an area where it's so important to get uh, the correct advice and the, the correct guidance. So really what I want to start off by saying is that the decision to terminate a building co contract often and rightly is referred to by lawyers as the nuclear option, which is the, why I've got that little slide there to kind of emphasise that point. And it needs safeguards before that proverbial red button is actually um, looked for. Uh, and the, it's, it's not without reason that uh, I have a little cartoon there of a chap with a lower leg missing because of the fact that you can actually suffer quite serious injuries in this legal minefield. So it's a serious step not to be taken lightly, an exceptional sanction which should only be used when fundamental breaches or violations take place and then only where all possible steps have been taken to avoid it. Now, the traditional approach of the judges, and we'll be talking about the judges a little bit, or I shall be, is the sanctity of contract. And the, the Latin tag, pacta sunt servanda, agreements must be kept, is of primary importance. 
In fact, in the 1953 Hamlin Lecture, English Law and Moral Law, Professor Goodhart stated that the moral basis of contract um, is that the promisor has by his promise created a reasonable expectation that it will be kept. And so generally, our judges respect the sanctity of contract, but the parties must, unless legally excused from performance, to perform their respective duties under the contract. So when the courts construe uh, termination clauses, they start really by looking at the consequences. They start from the point of view that termination is a draconian remedy, which brings the contract to an end with dramatic consequences. So over the years, the courts have evolved uh, principles of construction that mean that you cannot really terminate contracts by accident. So my message is really to ensure that you know what's required before you exercise a right to terminate. It's also important to understand that um, you, what, what happens if you do something uh, wrongfully can end up uh, terminating your, your contract with adverse consequences. But of course, termination is not all bad. Clearly, it's sometimes something that's very necessary. It's a very powerful self-help remedy. And damages are not always an adequate remedy after all, as we know. Sometimes you have to chuck the contractor off the job or treat the employer's conduct as fundamentally abhorrent um, in relation to uh, the contract, such as to bring it to an end. And of course, termination um, as, a, as an ob objective helps to mitigate the burn in relation to contracts that are beginning to head into a terrible, um, over-costly situation. And of course, this government only last month shows that it's pretty adept at chopping large elements of contracts out, as with HS2. But the message I want to get across really is that the exercise of the right of, uh, and the remedy to terminate gives rise to associated risks of getting it wrong being one of them and requires very careful consideration and, dare I say, legal advice. And, and my paper will certainly seek uh, to identify the chief issues but obviously I don't claim to cover everything and I won't be able to cover it all in this particular session. So what about um, terminating um, contracts in terms of the key principles and considerations in averting it? Well, one of the things I uh, wanted to, to make and emphasise is that before terminating a contract, consider whether you want the relationship to end and whether you should continue with the contract but reserve the right to claim damages. Because sometimes it's a bit of a knee-jerk reaction to actually uh, seek to look at the termination provisions in the contract without thinking through the process. Consider the alternatives you know, in, to doing so, as rather than being the end of your troubles, you may find that um, it's the start of them. So it's important, uh, I, I say, to look at the viable alternatives to termination. Because generally, um, in a lot of contracts, one sees that, that, that there isn't enough patience in terms of, of actually making time to look at things. One can often, uh, for example, de-scope work, resequence projects. Obviously, it takes negotiation. You can have lagging alterations to the phasing of a project that might make it more possible for the contractor to uh, deliver the project or for the client, in fact, to get the necessary funding if it's a funding issue. And of course, in relation to the relationship between the parties, if it's still intact and has not been killed off by various disputes along the way, a line in the sand type of settlement, uh, a deed of variation drawn up to modify the contract, maybe you know, take out some of the work, um, reprice some of it, is potentially possible and might be a preference to actually terminating the contract. And then of course, taking where we are in, in, in uh, the, the kind of economy at the moment, Obviously, interest rates, base rate at 5.25. Uh, last week, I think inflation at 4.6% was the current figure. It's gone down a little bit. But the pressures in relation to traditional good old lump sum contracting, as we're very familiar with in JCT world, has meant that a lot of contractors are suffering some very serious consequences of being held to their contracts and are making active decisions as to whether they continue with them in some cases because they have very little options and places to go. So termination is all about contract. But if you're a defaulting contractor, we commonly call termination in the vernacular um, being chucked off the job, as I mentioned earlier, or being turfed off. But in terms of termination, it is a process in relation to 
the cessation of future obligations under the contract. So it's a remedy for breach, and in commercial cases, obviously, which we're mostly involved with, the real remedy being sought is not necessary a remedy in terms of seeking damages or compelling a party to comply with something, but rather the termination is being sought as a remedy to obtain the ability to actually exit the contract early. And I think I got a slide saying something to that effect here. But strictly speaking, termination means that the contract is discharged. So in other words, the future obligations um, owed by the parties fall away and the contract, the contractor doesn't actually, uh, the contract doesn't actually cease to exist. It's the process of terminating the contract for breach, which is, is essentially prospective only. Now, like a lot of things in the law, there's quite a few definitional difficulties that are associated with um, the terminology. And there is a diverse vocabulary um, used both judicially and commercially to describe the process by which parties um, bring a contract to an end before it's been fully executed. And um, the slide's probably more appropriate. And, um, in relation to that, uh, I mean, it's interesting taking JCT itself that the word termination um, has only really come about in the JCT family since uh, the 2005 edition. Certainly most of my career, it was determination as used in the 1963 form and good old clauses 27 and 28. But I think the change in terminology by the JCT helps to reduce the confusion as determination to most people was about deciding something or resolving it. Whereas, of course, termination doesn't always necessarily lead to that position and I think is a better label. But of course, there are other labels that are spar to the same thing but don't quite um, bring about the same outcome. And there is obviously determination and termination I just mentioned. There is also renunciation forfeiture and rescission and repudiation itself. And obviously I'll be talking about that as well in a moment. But the different labels are not truly synonymous. And, I, and, what, and two particular examples of that are in relation to what is forfeiture and rescission. I want to just touch on those very briefly. As with rescission, some judges and commentators, especially trital on contract, persist in using the term rescission to describe termination um, of a contract for breach and I think that's a bit misleading. I say that because rescission means setting a contract aside ab initio, and that's generally because of a defect in its formation, for example, say for misrepresentation. So it's not the same process as terminating for breach, which is prospective only. And the other, other uh, term I think that is sometimes confused is the term forfeit. And some of the older construction textbooks uh, I think are at fault for this. But forfeit or forfeiture is used in different contexts. In the real property world, uh, forfeiture is synonymous with an express term or right um, of re-entry, for example, in a lease. It's a proprietary right. But outside of land law, the word forfeiture is used to describe a loss of rights, say over something like a license. And termination in that context is different from uh, what I'm referring to in relation to termination, say for, for, for repudiatory breach, which isn't, for, which isn't forfeiture, but is something that exists independently of the written terms of the contract, with forfeiture being essentially a creature of the contract. And then moving on to renunciation, this occurs when a party expressly or by implication, by words or conduct, evinces an intention not to perform a contract or expressly declares they'll be unable to perform it. So it's something that we can recognise. And I'll look at a, a couple of instances of that in a moment. But probably the most easily understood form of um, repudiation is renunciation, where a party shows that it's no longer intending to perform the contract. And um, in that regard, an interesting case of not that long ago of, of um, multiplex construction in Cleveland Bridge. Um, in that particular case, the subcontract was actually for the de design and construction of the Wembley Arch uh, at, uh, at Wembley Stadium. Cleveland Bridge ceased work, contending that multiplex's failure to make payment amounted to a repudiatory breach. Uh, Mr Justice Jackson, as he then was, rejected the contention and held that it was Cleveland who had repudiated by serving notice of termination and stopping work. Uh, 
And so they committed the repudiatory breach, but it really was essentially a renunciation uh, situation. Um, so what is the common law termination? What is the common law termination for repudiatory breach all about? Well, the common law, oh, I think I've got this my slide. Um, the common law gives every contracting party the right to um, terminate a contract if there's been an act of repudiation. Often it's the question about what amounts to repudiation that's the key issue. But, and so really my question is, what does that really mean from a lawyer's point of view? And, and, and the answer to that is, uh, conduct is repudiatory, and the famous kind of terms and passages you'll come across is if it deprives the innocent party of substantially the whole benefit um, of, of the contract intended to be received from the performance of the obligations under the contract. And it's otherwise known as uh, the substantially the whole benefit test, which comes from a fairly famous case for lawyers called Hong Kong Fur Shipping versus Kawasaki. And when the defaulting party breaches the contract, the innocent party may have no intention, or indeed uh, at that stage, of claiming damages or seeking specific performance. It's basically wanting termination. That's just the specific outcome it's looking for. There is no uh, compulsion or legal requirement to sue for damages, after all. In a reputatory situation, you can simply proceed um, to terminate. Obviously, it requires bags of confidence, but that goes, I think, without saying. So there's no specific um, definition of what amounts to uh, repudiation. Um, the hallowed words um, are the breach that must be sufficiently serious as it goes to the root of the contract. You'll see that in many of the cases. But think in terms of some examples I've got here. Um, the contractor refusing to start, a case called Gold Group and BDW trading, an abandonment of the project in Galway and Samuel, an employer barring access to the site, the case of Sandbar and Pacific Parkland, and a situation where the employer decides to instruct another contractor. And there's a, quite a few cases on that, but this particular one I'm quoting is Sweetfield and Hathaway. And because there's no one definition of reputatory breach, and establishing such a breach depends on the precise circumstances. This in itself creates a peril that the terminating party will be itself be held to have improperly terminated the contract. So the hunter almost becomes the hunted in that context. But where there's a reputed true breach by one party, the other party will have the right to elect to terminate the contract under the common law by accepting the breach, but obviously it's a bit binary. The other option is to elect to affirm. And termination is not automatic. That's an important thing to understand. Yes, there are automatic termination provisions in some contracts. JCT, before 2005, had automatic termination for insolvency. But that's not something that, that is, it, is the standard position. Now, what about if the breach is um, a modest breach? and potentially not reputatory. Well, the rule there is if it's a modest breach, then the other party must still proceed to perform his obligations, but will be able to obviously claim compensation for breach and breaches consisting of things like negligent emissions or bad workmanship of themselves, unless they're very severe or serious, are not necessarily going to be reputatory. So hence, never has the phrase I've, I've put in my paper here, the of acting in haste and repenting at leisure been more appropriate than in relation to those that seek to claim reputatory breach too quickly. An employer who acts quickly has the potential to shoot itself in the foot. If, however, the breach is very material, i.e. fundamental, and to one that goes to the root of the contract, then the innocent party obviously gets the right to elect to terminate um, the perform their performance under the contract. And the Cleveland Bridge example is, is one such one, one such area. But there are two more difficult areas, and I hope I've got a slide on that. Yes, I have, um, which I want to just briefly touch on. And they tend to cause the most difficulties in practice, in my experience. And that is um, termination, reputatory allegations in relation to delay on projects. And the one I mentioned briefly earlier on, non-payment of sums under the contract. And there's a lot of common law on uh, non-payment, and for the 
lawyers in the audience watching, you'll be familiar with the fact that generally the common law starting position is non-payment is not a repudiatory situation, at least not until it's been repeated and sustained. So my, uh, really my advice here is when you think about something being repudiatory, don't just look once or twice, but then a third time and probably have a fourth look as well. For those that want any particular references to where you can find more about the whole concept of repudiatory breach and breaches going to the root of the contract, I advise you go to the 34th edition of Chitty, which will keep you reading all night if you wish to. Um, now, in terms of the effect of um, repudiation, um, I mentioned a, a moment ago that, it, that um, it's somewhat binary. Um, perhaps I haven't got a slide on that. Um, yeah, I'll come back to that. Um, yes, it, it's somewhat binary. And really, what re when repudiation occurs, the innocent party really has essentially two choices. First, he can elect to accept the repudiation and thereafter, the party who repudiated cannot go back to the status quo ante before the repudiation, at least not without the agreement of the innocent party. Sometimes that does actually happen in, in practice. But not only is the innocent party discharged from further performance of the obligations under the contract, he can also sue for damages. And of course, the leading case is there, Heyman's, Heyman and Darwin's and, and photo productions and Securicor, demonstrating you can go straight off to court. Secondly, of course, the innocent party can elect to affirm so should a party, in terms of the risk of repudiation, should a party faced with a repudiatory breach elect to terminate? If it does, it, there are two principal risks. The first is the breach will not be found to be repudiatory for some of the problems I've mentioned a second ago. And secondly, the innocent party that affirms the contract will then lose its right to terminate, potentially, if it then uh, makes a belated attempt to terminate for a repudiatory breach because its conduct is inconsistent with that. And that often arises where demands for payment and so forth are made. Now, in terms of what remedies there are for, um, uh, for repudiation, I wanted to mention this. A party that accepts a repudiatory breach may seek damages for loss. That's normally uh, predicated on the loss of bargain basis or seek a reasonable price for the work done on a quantum merit basis. Loss of bargain damages are the most common way in which um, damages are sought for a repudiation. And that tends to be uh, for the loss of opportunity to receive the future performance of the contract, typically a loss of profits claim based around the contract price. But there is actually a second potential option and that is quantum merit. And in relation to quantum merit, the situation is that um, there is a potential claim for reasonable value without reference to the contract. Now, there's a couple of interesting cases here, and I won't spend too long on them, but Loader and Slowey is one of them. It's a 1904 case, and it basically was along these lines that it's long been established that an innocent party may elect uh, to claim quantum merit. And the support for this decision in Loader comes from the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, no less. And it was it decided in that case that on the basis that once there has been a termination for repudiatory breach, the relevant contract is rescinded ab initio. And therefore, it's as if, if the contract never existed. So if the contract never existed, you could go to restitutionary principles and quantum merit. But that case um, in 2004, exactly 100 years later, was disapproved quite strongly by the, the uh, House of Lords in a case called Taylor and Mobility. Because obviously the, the current modern view, and I mean after the last 60 or 70 years, is that repudiation doesn't actually kill off the contract ab initio. And therefore the primary obligations in terms of, of the effect of the repudiatory breach are essentially still there. So there's an Australian case called Mann and Patterson Construction, which is worth having a look at. It's in my paper for those that want to download that. And they referred to uh, the decision in Loder as the rescission fallacy because it doesn't accord with current legal thinking. I want to just briefly mention one thing. A couple of colleagues mentioned in the office about um, the uh, JCT contracts in particular is the express reservation of rights that you have 
on the clause eight stop, three stop, one of the current editions. And that is uh, the provision that says, you know, without prejudice to any other rights or remedies. There's quite a bit of law on that. Again, not time to go into it in detail. Suffice to say that the 1963 form was reviewed um, quite closely by a quite important case called London Borough of Merton and Leach in 1985, where the court held that the elaborate machinery of the contract was not exhaustive of all of the contractor's remedies, and the contractor retained an unfettered right to make a claim for damages as in, in the alternative uh, for claims for direct loss and or expense. So obviously there is, the wording is balanced and JCT is standardly uh, provided in terms of the contractor and the employer in terms of those preservations. It's sometimes struck out, but it's, I think, an important point to get over. Um, in terms of um, uh, conditions, warranties and innominate terms, I just briefly wanted to mention that a party may terminate a contract for a breach of a condition, but never for a breach of a warranty. Terms that are neither conditions or warranties are called, uh, a great creature, this name, innominate terms. And it may be possible to terminate a contract for breach of an innominate term if the breach is sufficiently serious. But again, the modern view of the judges of this country, English judges, is that um, in, in connection with what you're actually looking for, the shift in legal thinking is towards the seriousness of the breach and its consequences, rather than whether something is termed a condition or a warranty, or a nominate term, not that you would see that referred to very often. But the general sort of starting point is that a breach of a condition as opposed to a warranty will constitute a reputatory breach potentially, and then a sufficiently serious breach of a of a innominate term might also do so, or also do so, and a refusal to perform, obviously, if it's a, a renunciation, would again be repudiatory. Um, the great discussion on conditions and, no, and warranties and uh, and innominate terms is from that Hong Kong fur shipping case that I've I've touched on briefly. So, as I say, the important thing is looking at the effect of the breach and asking if the breach has substantially deprived the innocent party of the whole benefit. That's how you kind of get the interrogation of whether the breach is repudiatory. Um, a couple, uh, well, one quick case I want to touch on in relation to where this was uh, front and centre was a case called Amperius New Homes Holdings and Telford. And in that particular case, um, it illustrated the difficulty in establishing a breach of an innominate term as being repudiatory uh, in relation to a contract that was slightly unusual. It was a, a development agreement in which um, ultimately the um, sponsor of the project was going to gain the benefit of 999 year leases and it sought um, effectively to, re to treat as repudiatory the conduct of the contractor developer uh, contractor developing the, the project because it had got into significant delay, partly because of the credit crunch and various other reasons. But what was interesting, and it's slightly creative judgment, the Court of Appeal held that the developer's 18 month delay in carrying out the works did not amount to a repudiatory breach, looking at the contextual situation of a 999 year lease, which was going to be the benefit derived. So the decision emphasizes the need to consider the benefit the injured party was intended to obtain from performance of the contract before assessing whether the breach is repudiatory. So it's, a, it's, it's probably a means by which the court achieves fairness. Now, I'm going to speed on in relation to the next area that I want to look at, which is um, the question of what are the real indispensable and essential actions for termination preparation. Because if anything that I want to give out of this uh, lecture is the things that come from the benefit of experience. So my, my questions, are, my points are these. Um, do you have, a, have the justification and the right to terminate? Contracts obviously usually only allow termination in specified circumstances like JCT does. Um, it's important to ensure that the facts and the documentary record support the right to terminate. Contracts may also permit termination for convenience, but remember, where you terminate for convenience, there is no ability to recover uh, compensation uh, or, or completion costs in terms of the extra over cost to complete. Um, so, you know, the benefit of being able to pull the trigger and pull the rug is great, but that's a downside. Um, my next point was, what contractual steps must you pursue before terminating? It's an extremely important point. What notice are you required to give uh, the employer or the contractor? 
is there a cure period? I mean, invariably there is, like JCT, so that um, either the contractor or the employer can basically make good. That's assuming that it is remediable. Ha have you carefully considered and determined any claims for additional time? This is such an important area, and I see mistakes repeatedly made where terminations become wrongful because there is an extant entitlement by the contractor to time, and the contract administrator or employer's agent has not considered the uh, objective uh, entitlement of the contractor to time, particularly for terminating for not proceeding regularly and diligently. There's a lot of law on that. Uh, one of my own cases, Sindel, Sindel and Solland in, in 2001, um, but also good old Merton and Leach is primary authority for that. Um, then is, termination, is your termination notice adequate? Again, very important this. Does it clearly articulate the grounds for termination? Uh, an ordinary commercial business uh, man would not see, for example, a sensible connection between a warning that's being given and then a large gap of time. And there's a whole series of cases where a party decides to give a warning notice but then waits 10 months and then decides to try and terminate the contract and there is no nexus between the two events that the notices relate to. I mean, it's unusual, but it does happen. Does it identify all the potential grounds for termination? Um, does it put them in the alternative? Does it avoid demanding that the contractor do the impossible? Terminating a construction contract in relation to where construction logic sits against the basis on which the termination might be propounded is going to fail. Have you carefully recorded the key decision making? I mean, generally the party with the most complete records is at a significant advantage. So if you're going to terminate, that's why I say it's important to prepare the ground and get ready by making sure that you're, you know, you're, you're creating your history as you go along to make your entitlement more likely to be upheld. Have you identified or appropriate, a, a replacement contractor? Replacing a contractor is exceedingly difficult. Um, often projects go further into, into delay when there's a, a termination. And what financial security have you got? Any bonds, any warranties, anything that you want to or are able to call uh, in relation to um, underwriting the position? What do you owe the contractor? You know, wh what, what is the financial position? That needs to be reviewed. And then, of course, what planning? What, what sort of aspects might be relevant in terms of funders, etc.? What materials on site? What plant might you want to take over? What intellectual property rights have you over the design of the contractor? But, all by all, but most importantly, get legal advice. Um, so there's a, those are the, the, those, these sine qua non, and I, I've got them on the slides here, but you will be able to download these at leisure after this lecture, are ones that um, I suggest you look at. In terms of the types of termination, uh, termination for cause, termination for convenience or at will, obviously those are the, uh, the most common. Termination by agreement, yeah, actually people do sometimes terminate by agreement. Um, impossibility and, and, and of performance and frustration. Those also exist. But as I mentioned earlier on, um, there are two broad bases or avenues for terminating a contract, and that, that is exercising the right in, that's in the contract, ACCA, the contract to termination, and the second is terminating for reputatory breach. Um, the, the other thing that's very important about termination uh, contractually is the requirement for strict compliance with the conditions set out in the contract. And to borrow an analogy from Lord Hoffman in a key case called Manai Investments and Eagle Star uh, in 1997 concerning notice validity, um, there's a famous passage where he said, if the clause in the contract had said that the termination clause had to be on blue paper, and it, it would have been no good to serve the notice on pink paper. So identifying and satisfying termination conditions is often more complex than just obviously getting the right colour of paper, but it makes the point about the significance of compliance. Secondly, even where a termination notice is correctly drafted and validly served, a right to termination can be inadvertently lost or a party acts in a manner which is inconsistent with the termination of the contract. And the common one is, is, is the one I mentioned earlier about seeking uh, payment arrears and then seeking to try and terminate on the basis of non-payment. So I say watch out for that carefully. But the most common grounds, uh, contractual grounds for termination are for the occurrence of specified breaches, and of course JCT is all over that. Um, but a couple of points on that in relation to cure notices, and that is that the breach 
can potentially be rectified within a certain period of time. Watch out for that. Again, it's a common area where mistakes are made and breaches are cured and they are overlooked or tried to almost be ignored. The defaulting party uh, can sometimes show cause as to why the contract should not be terminated. And sometimes one gets great long submissions in relation to why that might be the case. And occasionally there are the plausible reasons that are given up, given out. So again, look at that closely. But the three main ways that termination, in my experience, can, can go awry are procedure, i.e. cocking up on the notices, cocking up on who you serve uh, the notice upon, and getting the time limits wrong. Election, i.e. improperly making an election on a reputatory breach. And cure, 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 cure. So many mistakes on cure. Um, and there's a recent case on that, um, which I'll, I'll touch on, that was handed down in the TCC only, only last week. So in order to rely on a contractual termination for breach, specific drafting always needed for contractual termination, as not every breach gives an innocent party um, the right to bring the contract to an end. But of course, by express provisions in a construction contract, you can set out breaches that would not otherwise be repudiatory as, as giving you grounds to terminate. Then briefly, I wanted to touch on the question of unreasonable and vexatious and what that means. We've got a very helpful case in terms of unreasonable and vexatious, because as you know, neither the employer or the contractor should be terminating for those on, on that basis. But what do those wonderful uh, legal words mean? Um, well, they've been decided as meaning that the, there mustn't be an ulterior or underhand motive to oppress, harass, or annoy, uh, as was decided in a case called Rhinewood and, and L.B. Brown by uh, his honour Judge Gilliland, Gilliland in a case a few years ago. And he established six propositions as to when something could be unreasonable or vexatious. And um, I think probably, the, I won't read out the six propositions themselves, but essentially the authorities show that the test is an objective one. The reference point is, is how a reasonable contractor would have acted in those circumstances. And sometimes it's an important ingredient that um, determination may be unreasonable if it's disproportionately disadvantages one of the parties. So that's, that's something to, um, to certainly uh, bear in mind. try and catch up the slides. In terms of other aspects on cures, um, cure periods only apply obviously where the breach is remediable. Not all breaches are. A party uh, does not need to comply with a notice and cure period when terminating for a repudiatory breach. I hope that's an obvious point. There's a key case called uh, Stonia and uh, Gearbulk Holdings, which expounded all of the virtues of common law termination uh, for a repudiatory breach. The right to terminate can be lost, um, and one of the examples of that is where breaches are cured. And a case decided by the TCC last week um, by Adrian Williamson uh, KC is Providence Building Services and Hexagon, which I'll try and come to before I finish this, this um, paper. So that's probably what I wanted to make a point about really there. Now, in terms of notice requirements, Another subtlety which I think is important to touch on before I quickly come to some cases is the contrasting hard line of Hudson on building and engineering contracts 14th edition that termination clauses must be strictly construed with a slightly more lenient stance taken in some other cases such as a case called Eminence and Kevin Heaney which was a contract uh, involving uh, the uh, purchase of uh, and sale of properties on a development where a notice of completion was um, served by the solicitor for the seller. But the solicitor unfortunately messed up in relation to the time limits in the contract and ended up effectively serving the notice improperly on the time limit. And I won't go into the detail of the judgment, suffice to say that the court decided that the conduct in that circumstance was not repudiatory and therefore that the buyer didn't uh, gain a, a, a right to treat it as repudiatory breach. So interesting case on its facts, but it shows that like so many things in the law, there's often a contrary position. But even if Hudson is right about its strict position, does a technical defect make the notice invalid? Well, again, on that, there are contrasting cases. So there's a case, for example, I mentioned there of um, energy holdings and Hommel, 
where it was decided the service of illegal notice by an unspecified means in the service of notices clause in the contract was still good service. So the court was quite liberal there. So a question I kind of ask is, is it likely that sending a termination notice on time, but by email, when the contract requires fax, a fax, facsimile, amounts to repudiation? Obviously, most people don't have fax machines in 2023, and a more instantaneous form of communication is email. And although the presumption and starting point is you comply with notices strictly, the position there is that there may be argument that that's good, a good termination notice. There are also some lovely creatures in the common law around um, uh, some, some principles which mean that one can rely on common law termination for circumstances which might not have been known at the time of termination. And there are two key cases there. There's one called the Ophelis and Lonsdale. Um, and really what that case uh, decided was that there's a long-standing rule that a party attempting to terminate is permitted to justify its termination on any grounds available at the time, even if those grounds were not known at the time of the termination. Now, the, 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 the one disadvantage in relation to that principle, which is very good at saving you from a wrongful termination, is that the damages that you're limited to are the damages on the basis of the, t of, of the, of the expressed basis on which you served your notice. But you can defend yourself with matters and facts in terms of justifying the termination that weren't known about at the time. There's a wonderful case called Boston Deep Sea Fishing and Ansel, uh, which demonstrates that the defence is available to the um, party that's being accused of wrongly terminating by relying on later events. I want to just zoom very, very quickly to um, JCT clauses uh, 1.71, 1.74, 1 only really to say that it's abundantly um, obvious by various decided cases, including recent ones, that you've got to follow the strict rules in relation to, for example, under 1.71, uh, serving notice by prepaid post uh, to the recipient's address in the contract particulars or at their registered or principal place of, of business. In relation to post, remember recorded, signed for and special delivery, precise ways in which to affect postal service are expressly provided for. Obviously you can still serve, serve personally as well, but it's so important to get these things right, otherwise the notices can be invalid. Um, in terms of the grounds on which you can terminate, um, the most hallowed and important provision in JCT in the standard form is good old 8.4.1. I haven't got time to go through the detail of it, but um, I have got a slide, which I think comes up next, which depicts the precise periods and obligations in when you, you are required to do things in relation to notices. And I still don't know why parties still make mistakes but they keep lawyers busy and they keep the courts buzzing with the failures that arise because these very straightforward provisions are not properly followed. I want to now very quickly have a look at some of the cases um, because there is actually, surprisingly, and that's one of the reasons I picked this topic, five or six key cases, even in the last 20 months on termination. One of the most important ones I want to touch on is a case that uh, my firm Fennec Elliott won in uh, December last year, an epic case that's still rolling through the TCC. I saw a judgment in some of the um, downstream provisions yesterday, and it's Energy Works Hull and MW High Tech Projects. This was a, a case where I'd say there were two paths to glory in the sense that both termination under the contract and termination under the... Um, termination under the... Um, uh, at common law were found to be appropriate and successful uh, for Energy Works Hull. What happened there, it was a major project, it was an, an energy from waste plant project, they never go well, I've not come across in 20 years a project that's been successfully built um, for any, any waste to energy, but the project um, ran into problems, significant overrun, it had an interesting provision with a 15% a cap on liquidated damages, which because of the delay by the contractor, MW, um, that bell was well and truly pinged uh, after 11 months of delay. And what happened was that Energy Works Hull served notice to terminate on a number of grounds, both under the common law right of repudiatory breach and also for express breaches. And MW, uh, the subcontractor, sought an extension of time for alleged breaches it said were perpetrated by EWH for failure to provide various things like fuel to test the burners for the incinerators. 
And Mr Justice Pepperell found that MW's significant delay in suspension in the commissioning of the plant and its various uh, culpable conduct in relation to such things as um, misrepresenting uh, and misreporting on contract failures, misreporting on programmes and generally repeatedly lying about aspects of the project delivery constituted repudiatory breach. It's a very long judgment. It's well worth reading and I can't really do justice to it, safe to say it's a seminal case and deals with lots of the earlier authorities. There are four or five other key cases. Um, I'll deal with them as quickly as I can. Thomas Barnes and Blackburn and Darwin Borough Council. It's a JCT contract, it's standard building form 2011. The contractor, Thomas Barnes, unilaterally suspended work uh, on a project to build a bus station. The council terminated the contract for the alleged delays and actually proceeded to appoint a new contractor. The council solicitors issued a default termination notice on various grounds. Uh, they relied on failing to proceed regularly and diligently. They relied also on common law grounds for repudiatory breach. And the notice expressly um, set out a number of bases. So on the face of it, it was quite, quite a good notice. But where it failed was uh, in compliance with where the notice was served, and more particularly uh, the use of email, which is not contractually recognised by the JCT contract. Um, and what happened was that even the notice that was then served by post, because JCT has that rule about two days being allowed for um, sending recorded delivery post, um, meant that the notice was actually also received late when it was sent by post. Now, the TCC held that um, this did not preclude uh, Thomas Barnes, uh, did not, sorry, prejudice Thomas Barnes, this failure to serve these notices in the sense of becoming reputatory because it had done such a dire, terrible job in terms of uh, delivering the project or not delivering it. And because of the fact that uh, Barnes had actually ceased operations on site, that in fact, there was every justification to say that um, they were in reputatory breach. But Barnes um, subsequently entered into liquidation and their administrators brought actions against the local authority uh, employer. But in, in the judgment of his honour, Judge Davies, he found that the employer, whilst it had failed to terminate under the contract because it cocked up on the notices, it had uh, a good common law ground for uh, terminating and, and that was valid. And so the contractor's claims failed. Um, the next case I want to touch on is Struthers and um, Davies. It's a decision of um, Mr. Andrew Singer, um, K QC as he was then, 2022 case. Um, this was a domestic contract, that RIBA contract not used a great deal, the domestic building contract. And in this case, the um, employers, the Struthers, um, they uh, are having suffered delays on their project with their builder agreed um, that they would seek to uh, the privately with the Mr. and Mrs. terminate the contract. But unfortunately, the first notice of intention to terminate was sent by the employer and not the architect as that RABA form specifies, so they got the wrong person. And there was a long series of arguments about what the proper basis of serving the notice was. Uh, there was reliance on a case called Ob Obrascon and um, Attorney General for Gibraltar, which was an Aikenhead case where it had been held that notice sent to the incorrect address uh, could potentially be valid, as in that case. But that argument got nowhere with the judge in this case because he decided there were very good reasons for acquiring the initial notice of intention to come from the contract administrator and not the employer. And again, referred to a number of authorities that were cited to him. But he did find that the termination was, uh, was permissible because of repudiatory breach and then set out the various reasons why, things like refusing to purchase materials, using uh, pro project materials on other projects, various other things the contractor did which were pretty ghastly. And horrid. Now I'm conscious I've got uh, 11 minutes left and um, I am thinking that I probably will say very very quickly something about the Toppleson case in Rolls-Royce only to say a very interesting case to do with uh, termination of a contract for some um, digital visualization tools that customers would use if they were buying Rolls-Royces those that are privileged to do that so that they could get a bespoke viewing through VR unit of what they're about to purchase. Toppleson, the software company, cocked up, couldn't produce the software, was late on everything like a lot of IT contracts. 
Um, there was an argument in relation to um, termination. Uh, Rolls-Royce sought to terminate on, on an initial notice. It then followed with a further notice. Um, Tobelson sought to be very clever and initially said that it was going to hold Rolls-Royce to the contract, even though the contract was, re was repudiatory. Uh, Rolls-Royce then served a further notice. But to cut a long story short, um, the contract did provide for time being of the essence. There were some very creative arguments as to why um, Topolson thought that it was actually entitled to damages for breach uh, and uh, its alleged arguments on reputed breach. But what's interesting is that Rolls-Royce actually succeeded in recovering, I believe, 20 million euros and the claim was successful um, both at common law and for termination under the contract. The other, only other very important but quick case I'll touch on is Bellis. Bellis is a case, Bellis and Sky House, really demonstrating the whole business about clear days. If there's any lawyers out there that don't know what clear days mean, you need to be put against a wall and shot. Um, it's very much like the white, white book principles. I think it's very important that this audience is familiar with reckonable days, both because there are express provision in the contracts and there is uh, no excuse for not checking the provisions in the contract for time. So that case is a key one. And last but not least, um, the case that I wanted to touch on of Providence Building and Hexagon Housing, which was decided last week or just over a week ago. And this was an important decision for the simple reason that um, it really demonstrates that maturation of a right to terminate for a breach of non-payment under a contract, this was a JCT uh, standard building contract, for failing to um, pay on time. If in the cure period the employer did pay the payment to the contractor within that time, you cannot then, with a half-cooked termination notice based on a, a first breach, a default notice, um, succeed in actually demonstrating that you've got an entitlement to terminate if the, in the cure period, it's another of those cure period cases, the contract came good. So I think I am probably going to close at that point, only to say one important thing, which is that there is a bit of a ritual that often goes on. It's a bit like a dance in construction contracts with termination. I've been involved on maybe five, 10 different projects where major termination issues have arisen. And there's a bit of a dance and a bit of a ritual that goes on in the correspondence, each side uh, asserting its respective position. In the meantime, the project is busily being built out by the contractor. Uh, payments are, are being made sometimes insufficiently by the employing organization. And ultimately, it's a question of who blinks first and who decides to terminate. But you sometimes end up in a situation where termination is a threat. The threat of it is enough to keep people on their toes. The project has turned out as, as uh, is, is delivered and completed. But if one of the parties does blink first, then, then the terminator comes out and the gun goes to the head. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Um, so um, just to remind you that you are uh, allowed to send in your questions and observations on what you've just heard. And I'm pleased to say we've been given a short extension of time if we need to for the questions. Oh, um, oh you, did, you did mention there was a little poem that you... you yes, you... Those, I, 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 I'm doing quite a lot with chat GBT at the moment uh, through various exercises in the office. And I, I decided partly because we've got a cyborg and a, a kind of, you know, a, a machine that the robot and the terminators to see what uh, chat gbt could make interesting as a poem on termination and if the audience is interested i can briefly read it in the world of construction contracts align yet dangers arise when it's time to resign terminating the bond a perilous quest in english law's maze when clauses infest builders and owners in disputes they wade in the shallow of contracts and precarious shade Delay and defects a tumultuous trail, breaching the terms can quickly derail. In the dance of the law, where intricacies spin, terminating construction, a perilous sin. Notice provisions and damages at play, a careful exit, one must strategize and weigh. In the perilous field where disputes can ignite, terminating construction, a legal fight. So tread with caution in this legal domain, where dangers lurk and disputes may reign. In the world of construction where perils accrue, terminating contracts proceed with legal ado. In the realm of construction where contracts in play, terminating titans, tight termination ties can brighten the day as paths to progress and new tales are told, um, release from delays, a burden unbound. Terminating construction 
freedom is found, flexibility reigns uh, as needs re realign. A fresh start emerges, a contract, contract design, and so on. Um, it goes on further. I mean, there isn't I, I time to read it. I insist that you actually post it with the, uh, with I will. the slides after. I will. So. Um, Just that in 12 seconds. <laughs> so, I mean, listening to you talk about this, Simon, um, it does strike me that one might, one might say goodbye to a service provider such as a designer, and that might be the cause of heartbreak. Um, terminating a building contract is a bit more like a divorce. Would you agree with that sentiment? No, I, I would actually, yeah. I mean, you actually virtually need counselling, yeah. I mean, the run up to it requires so much preparation. If it's, I mean, if it's a major project, obviously it's a small project, people take risks a little bit more, you know, a bit more freely. So but not to be entered into lightly. Not to be entered into lightly. And, and it, it, there are so many participants in the process of terminating a contract, you know, upstream, downstream, funders, sites, projects, you know, permissions, and uh, it's getting all of that to be appreciated and, and you know often clients don't appreciate it particularly if they don't procure very often and you end up with this important sort of secession with the client about you know what they're embarking on. Been there worn the t-shirt. So <laughs> we have some so it has some questions from our audience. Um, I thought this one was very interesting because it brings out some of the points that you were discussing. So under the um, the MTC contract it refers to without reasonable cause failing in such a manner to comply carrying out of any order or orders is materially disrupted, suspended or delayed. And the question is making the point about what if it's a very small order? What is the threshold for termination if it's just the one order that's not um, carried out, um, it's disrupted? It's, yeah, there's no specific authority on that specifically that I've come across. Um, I would imagine, I would say that it would need to be more than something that's minor. It'd have to be more material. Do you think that it, if somebody uses um, termination in those circumstances uh, as a ploy that that could be seen as vexatious? It potentially could. I mean, you, you'd, you'd have to do the weighing up exercise that um, was mentioned by Gilliland in his six propositions and sort of test, test your you know, prima facie termination situation and see whether that passed that, that test. That's very As, interesting because that, that had never actually occurred to me. Because, I mean, that is a good point because there are, there are some prima facie termination situations that look at first blush to be okay to terminate. And, you know, you might, your knee jerk reaction might be that that's fine. But it's just when you read the judgments and you see what arguments do come up that judges are sometimes receptive to sort of, you know, equitable arguments sometimes you know, in terms of this proportionality about whether it's something, fair. whether it's fair and whether it hits one party harder than the other. And I think there's this policy view that where the endeavours of the contractor are significant in terms of delivering a project, managing the subcontractors, you know, managing the designers if it's a DB contract, that to kind of all of that baggage and investment needs quite a lot of, of things on the other side of the scale to kind of tip it to make it essentially justifiable. You think people react from emotion rather than logic? Well, I, th I think, yeah, I mean, often hatred <laughs> comes into the fight. Uh, often, you know, it's a personal thing. And I think one of the most important things is that sometimes, I didn't mention that, but changing the key personalities on the contract, you know, maybe the, the project manager. I mean, in the in the um, EWH case, there was a, a, a particular character. I won't name him to defame him, but, you know, he comes out in the judgment quite badly. And one can see that, you know, certain individuals, you know, you've got clauses that allow you to remove people. Maybe using some of those provisions might sometimes... It, it did occur to you when you were talking about, remember there's a cure period for a lot of these things. Yeah. I was thinking why on earth would you still want to terminate a contractor if they'd actually cured? I mean obviously there, there is some, there's sometimes manipulative cu curing yeah. of minor breaches yeah. but it may be that there's an illustration that people don't think about that because they're so set on terminating the relationship. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, lo and behold... Well, I, th I think sometimes you get the problem that it's almost declaratory. The contractor will say, it's normally the contractor that I see, uh, is, you know, that th there is conduct which, you know, that is, is, is warranting potential termination. They, they declare they're going to put resources on the job next week. They, they kind of send you a programme and so forth, but it's a bit they illusory. They everybody else yeah. that as well. Yeah, and they, uh, but, it, but it doesn't actually happen on site. You know, and that, that's when you need to get some metrics together to say, well, actually, you've got four blokes on the job, you should have 26, you know, the production's not happening. Um, this is a more philosophical question from Roland Finch. What is the difference between terminating the contract and terminating the contractor's employment under the contract? Yeah, well, t t the, obviously JCT has uh, used termination of the employment. It, it's essentially emphasising uh, termination of the contract. Uh, as I was saying earlier on, it, the contract isn't being killed off. Um, with a reputatory breach, you are effectively killing the contract off. But um, 
you aren't killing it off in relation to the potential right to damages. I think that's the important point. I mean, obviously, what's a very interesting area in relation to that kind of question is, you know, things like liquidated damages, the right we now know because of, obviously, the Supreme Court decision in, in tri, tri, was it tri plan? Um, uh, triple point, uh, deciding, you know, what you're entitled to do by way of claiming liquidated damages comes to an end when the contract um, is terminated. Um, but obviously it doesn't end entitlements to certain certain aspects of certain provisions in the contract that will survive, like um, confidentiality and so on, uh, as a product of the contract, but the obligations that were entered into at the outset. Um, but I mean, termination, sorry, termination, uh, the, uh, the point there that he's making there in relation to termination of, of your employment is essentially making the point that when those words are used, it's intended to keep in existence the contract. But cease performance. Yeah, cease performance physically, yeah. Um, so this is this is a situation I rec recognise. In the event of insolvency of a contractor, will this be a breach of contract and the client can terminate the contract before a formal notice is, is received? Now, I think we both have the situation where the site has been run down to the extent yeah. that it that it's run by one man and a dog and the dog's yeah. part-time yeah. and you suspect a creeping potential yeah. insolvency situation. Yeah. Um, what do you say to that? Well, that's, I, 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 in my paper, I say a little bit more about that, that people want to have a read about that. I think termination or, because obviously the termination clause in, in JCT is pretty thorough and it has the provisions about what dings the bell as an act of, of insolvency. And often rumors go round, the job goes quiet, as you were just saying, things get run down. But the real danger area is terminating before actually there is an event that qualifies as termination. And so just the site that, yes, you can potentially serve, serve a notice in relation to, to default on failing to proceed regularly and diligently, but as we all know, that's quite a difficult journey to go down. So with, with insolvency, I always say, I mean, obviously you, you've got to try and get some tangible evidence that, that there's an event that, that qualifies under the contract. What about repudiatory breach for running the site down to a token presence because that's something you see a lot. Well, as I think well. that then I think potentially that if again you've got to get your fact you've got to get your ducks in a row basically if you can demonstrate that and you're you've got your your you know your your kind of working paper as to your submission on that having happened then you could terminate a common law. Interesting alternative, isn't it? Um, I mean, the thing is, is the bravery factor at that point uh, is that once clients get advised, you know, they they start to get more cautious at that point. Come on, if you're hard enough. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Come on, if you're hard enough. Yes, yeah, so, incidentally, this client did terminate for a repudiatory breach. Um, so, this is a bit of a broad subject. Do you have any comments in relation to the termination of the JCT subcontracts? Uh, you may not know the details of that minutely. Um, I, I mean, I have been involved with termination uh, of subcontracts. I mean, do, do you mean the position, obviously, when the main contract is terminated, is that yes. what they're asking? I'm assuming that's what they mean. Yeah, yes. and obviously then generally the subcontracts obviously follow suit, suit as I understand it, under JCT. Even though those, the people are not necessarily at fault. Well, um, they're not at fault, no. I mean, and that is, uh, you know, unfortunately in, 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 in recessions and difficult climates and obviously what happened on, you know, Carillion, et cetera, as an example, huge quantities of the industry go out of business because of main contractors going down and, you know, poor subcontractors being... In, in great problems. And I think in my paper, one of the things I actually address is direct payments to subcontractors and the risks around that, that there aren't any easy remedies for those subcontractors who find that they are on the end of a, a termination line because of the main contractor being terminated. And, you know, the, the offers of work from the employer about direct and so on, we all know are a very trappy sort of area with Difficult lots of things that could go wrong, yeah. So this is a question from Simon Cash. Under termination, you refer to secondary terms such as damages, etc. What is the position in terms of maintaining insurances and latent defects when a contract is terminated? Well, I mean, those are those are notifiable events. Uh, one would obviously want to go back and check the insurance policy in relation to that. But on termination, generally, the obligation to insure comes to an end. Oh, this is, this is praise for you, Simon. Excellent lecture on a very terrific, tricky subject. Um, look forward to studying the notes. Always well, nice there's, to hear. It's, 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 as I said at the beginning, it's, it's, it's always going to make law and it is always, you know, it's a dynamic area. And the courts are, are busy looking at it. And it's not just in construction, in, in the commercial courts, there's a lot of very useful judgments. Um, can you please explain when and if liquidated damages are applicable? In the event of termination, from the employer's point of view, when the contractor or when the contractor suspends work for non-payment, 
And when does non-payment become a repudiatory breach? I mean, obviously, if you if you, if you, term, if you suspend lawfully under operating the machinery of the contract, then liquidated damages aren't running against you if you ultimately demonstrate your suspension. But again, you can't have your cake and eat it. Can't have your cake but again, it, it is a consideration when often the threat, you know, the seven-day notice that's written to the main contractor by a subcontractor often results in a, a six-page letter from the city firm of solicitors as to what will happen if you persevere with it. Um, this is a very technical question. What is your view on the Providence decision? Even though the default was cured, it was still repeated. Yeah, well, I, th I, think, it, I think what's interesting there is if you had a situation where there was repeated failures of the employer to pay, and this certainly happened on a couple of occasions at least, and I, I, I have read by looking at on the internet that actually uh, the party that lost that case is obviously feeling very hard done by, just because obviously it felt that it was being screwed over by the client. Um, but there potentially might be a repudiatory case that could be made up. If that went on four or five times, I think that that potentially would be a repudiatory breach case. But for the purposes of operating that machinery, if every time you know, in the 14-day cure period on the 13th or you know, in a minute before midnight, the payment came in, it's a slightly frustrating situation. But that's what I mean about cynical cure of breaches. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that would be. It would be. I, I mean, the, the, I think what was helpful in Williamson's judgment is that he does, he does explain that there just needs to be some kind of, you know, sharp lines in relation to these clauses and he, he took the view that he did and that JCT had drafted um, clause 8 the way it had you know on um, purpose. This is more of a comment this is from Peter Hibbard by the way. Oh right. Good a point, point of clarification a notice under clause 174 JCT must be expressly required to apply otherwise 172 applies and here email is permissible. Oh yeah it's okay yeah yeah okay, well thank you Peter for that. Clarification. We, we are looking at electric transmission of notices for the next edition. Just so I mean, it, one thing I mentioned fax, faxes is, is that still in, it is surprising in modern contracts when seeing fax being specified or sometimes stipulated. Telex. Tele, yeah, telex. Yeah, we haven't seen for years. But it is in some contracts. I mean, certainly in some Indian and Pakistani contracts I've looked at, I've seen telex provisions in there, mm. even relatively recently. So I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today for questions. Thank you very much for listening in. And uh, the, the slides and the, um, the paper behind it, and indeed the poem, will be made available for your download in due course. Thank you very much.